God, I thank you for your presence that's here. Lord, that we know because of your word that when we call on your name and when we lift you up, you're here in the midst of us. And I thank you, Father, that your spirit is here, not just in this room, but wherever your name is lifted up. For those who are watching remotely, for your church that's gathering all around the world, you show up and you give us exactly what we need. Can somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God is good all the time. Amen. I'm looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us today. I can promise you that it will not be a message of eloquence, but I do feel God wants to help some of us today. Uh, when God impressed this message on my heart that I'll share in just a moment, my prayer was that his church would be relieved and released. And as God was speaking to me, I felt that relief and the release for my own life. And I'm, I'm excited to share what God has in store for us. I'm going to share the message title. We'll pray together and dive in. The message for us today is this. It's not how you start. It's that you're in it. I'm going to say that again. It's not how you start. It's that you're in it. Let me pray over us right now. Go ahead. You can clap your hands. That's all right. We need to, we need to mix what the word is going to say with our faith right now. Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, that you're calling your church to awaken right now. That we would have eyes to see what it is you're doing in our midst, Lord, and in this atmosphere. And that you are calling us and drawing us to participate, Lord, in what you are doing on the earth. I pray against any work of the adversary, any lies from the enemy. I pray, Lord, that any offenses or walls that we put up would be torn down. Lord, you've promised that where your spirit is, there there is a liberty. You promise that when you show up that you're the God of peace and you'll bring victory and allow us to have victory over the enemy. And I pray this, Lord, for your sweet people for this moment and time together and as you tarry. In your name, Jesus, I pray, let the church shout amen. Let the church shout amen. Amen. If you're ready for the word of the Lord, you may be seated. God bless you. Well, folks, is there any doubt that we're living in the last days? <laughs> it's almost a rhetorical question, is it not? All you have to do is turn on the news. Got wildfires everywhere, California, Australia, all across the world. We have pestilence and coronavirus and unrest and fear and hatred. Is there any doubt that we're in the last days? You see, Jesus had already known that this would happen. Jesus already knew that the world that we're in right now and the mess that it's in right now, he prophesied it, he foretold it, he warned us. And not only did he say that there was going to be trouble like we see right now in the last days to help us know, but he said his church would be victorious. He said in the midst of this mess, his church will advance. Oh, I think I need to encourage somebody in here. Do you remember when Jesus said that, that upon this rock he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church? I come to remind the church here that it doesn't matter the conditions of this world. Jesus promised that his church will advance. Amen. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is telling his disciples, his disciples are trying to figure out when is the last days? When is, when is the time going to come that, that, have been, that has been prophesied? And Jesus told him this. I'm going to start reading in, in, in chapter 24 here. He said, don't let anyone mislead you. There's going to be many that come in my name, claiming to be the Messiah, deceiving many. So there's going to be deception. He said, and you will hear wars and rumors of wars. Sound familiar? But Jesus said, don't panic. 
Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow just yet. But that's just going to be the sign. Nation will go after nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. Sound familiar? He said, all this is going to come. This is the first, first of the birth pains, but there's going to be more to come. Now, that's encouraging, isn't it? He says, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers, and many will turn away from, from me. They'll betray and hate each other. Man, this is just getting better and better. He said, many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Verse 12, sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold the next verse says but the one who endures to the end will be saved doesn't matter how you start it matters that you're in it the one who endures to the end will be saved jesus continues and he says the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come are you hearing the words of our savior he's given you a clue that we're in the last days right now and that we have a mission to preach the gospel to the whole world so the nations will hear it and then the end will come What surprised us or is news for us is not news for our Savior. Can we agree that God is in control? Can we agree that God isn't surprised by what's going on right now? That he knows the end from the beginning? <laughs> the end will be a glorious time for his church. Being caught up with Christ. I, I don't know about you, but I can't wait for the day. The, the right, Paul writes it this way. He says, it, when, it, when that happens, there'll be a sound from heaven. There'll be, there'll be a trumpet. We'll see Christ descend. The dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. That's going to be a glorious day. This end time will be something you're going to want to be in the church. But what is a good time for the church is a challenge for those outside. Second Thessalonians chapter one, I'm going to read. Paul tells us, and God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. And, and for us, when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and, and those who refuse to obey the good no news of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Let's keep reading. Then the name of the Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live, and you will be honored among, along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. I'm setting the stage here. Please, please catch this. God is giving us a window of grace in these last days to respond to his calling. Are you hearing me in here? There's going to be a time in which the judgment will be set. And it says those who do not respond to the gospel will be separated from God. And it is up to us, the church, to share the gospel, to share the good news, to share the message of salvation to a lost and dying world. God is giving us this window of grace to respond. Today is the day of salvation. It's, it's not how you start. It's that you're in it. Heavy stuff, huh? Believe me, I had some conversations with God leading up to the message. I wanted a softball for this, for this labor day. But I feel like God's wanting to get the attention of his church and of his people and he's wanting to relieve you and release you. The same God that knows the end from the beginning knows you. Think about that. 
The same God that knows the mess that the world is in knows the mess that you're in. Are you hearing me in here? The same God that knows the conditions of this world knows the conditions of your heart, and yet he's still calling us to be a part of his kingdom. He's still drawing us to participate in his mission. Jesus had you in mind all along. For such a time as this, you're not here by mistake. We're not here by mistake. Look around. God has a plan for that person's life. Go ahead. You can turn to your neighbor. That's all right. God has a plan for their life. He has a plan for them to play a part in this end time harvest. Here's when that happens during repentance. When you repent And you give your life to Jesus. You get baptized in his name. You're filled with his spirit. Your purpose changes. No longer are you serving your own purpose. No longer are you following after the the mission of this world or the enemy. But you're following after the mission of Christ. At repentance is when your purpose changes. When we follow Christ and there's a lost and dying world that's in need of a savior, in need of somebody to just share with them the good news. How can they have faith if they don't hear? How can they hear if there's not a preacher? How can there be a preacher unless one is sent? Let's look at Matthew chapter 9. Jesus has compassion. He, it says here, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness, every disease among the people. But verse 36, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. When he saw the conditions of the world, when he saw what what was going on in our cities, when he saw what was going on in our neighborhoods and in our homes, he was moved with compassion because they fainted. They were scattered abroad as a sheep having no shepherd. Verse 37, then he said to his disciples, to us, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I'm trying to remind somebody today, it's not how you start. It's that you're in it. It's that you're in it. It's that you're doing the work. You are the laborer that God has called. In fact, uh, Jesus tells a story to his disciples of, of a man who owned a vineyard, and he hired workers, and there was workers who agreed to work at the beginning of the day, and they worked that entire day, and, and, and there was more work to be done or a different part of the process to be done, so he got more workers in the middle of the day, in the afternoon, near the end of the day. And when he dished out the wages for the day, The ones who worked all day got a day's wages. The ones who only worked a few hours also got a day's wages. You know what that tells me? That tells me that if we're a part of the process, we can expect the same reward. Are you hearing me in here? We can enjoy the reward if we join the work. The hour may be late. It may be the last days, but we get the same reward. What Paul was working for, what the apostles were working for, what, what, what whoever led you to Jesus was working for is the same thing we're working for. You know, it doesn't matter how you start. It's that you're in it. We're all going to rejoice. The reaper and the harvester. Uh, the, this is the same thing. The sower and the reaper are going to jo- rejoice together because we all benefit from doing the work of the Lord. Amen. Let's talk about what this looks like. Jesus prayed. He, in, in John chapter 17, in his prayer, he said, I pray for these followers. But, but I'm praying also for all those who believe in me because of their teaching. Jesus wasn't just talking about the the disciples that were surrounding him right there as we read in the Gospels. He was talking about you because you believed. You responded when somebody shared the good news about Jesus to you. And you're going to share the Gospel to somebody else. And Jesus is praying for us to participate in that work. Church, it's time to go to work. It's time to go to work. This is what God has impressed on my heart for us today. We got to do the work. Turn to your neighbor through the mask and tell him, do the work. 
It doesn't matter what condition you're in when you start. Just start. Do the work. What's the work? Well, it's declare the gospel. Develop disciples. It's develop disciples. Declare the gospel. It's take new territory. Do the work. Church, it's time to do the work. I pray that we're without excuse. I praise God for our pastor. And I wish that he gets the rest and comfort he needs and comes back on fire. And what God has given our pastor for this congregation, part of his church is very clear. Nothing's changed since the beginning of the year. We are to take new territory. So you can't sit in the purple chair and say, what am I supposed to do? What work are you talking about? The vision for abundant life in 2020 is take new territory. The purpose of Abundant Life as an organization is to develop disciples who declare the gospel. You can't sit in the chair and say, what am I supposed to do? You're either developing disciples or you're developing yourself or you're declaring the gospel. Well, what does the pastor say? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, God has already given us what we need. He's already commissioned us to take new territory. Now it's up to us to do the work. Matthew 28, 19, often referred to as the Great Commission. This is, this is the game plan that Jesus laid out for his church. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What's that name? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Do the work. Church, idleness is not an option. If you are a believer who has repented, has been baptized in Jesus' name and and is spirit-filled, idleness is not an option. I think I expected some piddly claps on that one. But here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we all have to become stuffy, speaking in KJV language, monks in a monastery. Are you hearing me? God doesn't require us to abandon recreation or to never have fun. If you think that, you don't know God. But what I am saying and what I believe the Lord is telling us here is that we should never relax from the mission. There's a difference between recreation and relaxation. Recreation helps you to recreate, to rebuild, to refresh, to, to, to ease your mind so, so, that, so that you can be recharged for the mission. Relaxation says, I'm taking a break. Oh, man, I'm going to meddle here. Whew. I mean... When you're on vacation, is that recreation or relaxation? Are you disconnected from the, from the mission? Are you disconnected from the spirit? You know what? I won't meddle. We'll just leave it at that. You hear me? You got to do the work. Idleness is not an option. You have to do something. It's not how you start. It's that you're in it, that you're actually doing something. And, and you know, I praise God. We're experiencing revival all around the world. We just saw just a few reports of what's going on just, just recently. That's not to account for what God's been doing throughout this year all around the world. And that's not even accounting for what, what we haven't heard. The United Pentecostal Church is only one organization. And, and there's many others that are, that are preaching this gospel, that are teaching this truth. And, and we, there are people getting filled with the Holy Spirit all around the world. And I praise God for that. I praise God for Kyra, who got baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. I praise God for our campus ministry and our, and, and, and our hyphen, who, who is participating in the work that God's called them to. But Jesus said, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. We should pray for more. I praise God for for these ones that we're having every week by week. But God says, pray for more. 
why are there too few laborers, huh? Why, why, why are, why is there, 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 why are the believers too little of the believers doing the work? Are we just happy to let the energetic young people do the work of the Lord? Oh, I'm meddling. In fact, this next part is what I feel like God wants to do, really, really work on us about. In fact, we need to pray. Because what we're going to talk about in just a moment are the obstacles. What's stopping us from participating in the work of God? And it can't be because of what comes out of my mouth, but what God is going to do in this place. Can you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word, Lord, for the drawing you have of your people. I pray, Lord, that your spirit that's in this place right now would do work that I cannot do. Would go places of the heart that I cannot go. Lord, that you would that would free us, Lord Jesus, from the, these, these chains and these bounds, Lord, wherever they originate from, and loose your people to carry out what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more laborers. Why are there not more? That's because we are good at making excuses. We're good at making excuses. Conditions aren't right. I've got my own problems, right? Oh, oh, that's, that's a really good thing to do. I know mentally that I need to do that, but I have my own hangups. Can we go over my prayer list first and then I can get in the game? And and don't get me wrong. There's seasons of life, right? There's seasons of life where you have ebbs and flows, but, but never disconnect from the mission. If you can't do one thing, do another. But, but even though there's seasons of life, we need to be wary of excuses. You need to check yourself for when you're making excuses. And I say you, I'm talking to myself too. Guys, I'm so talking to myself. You know what stops us, these obstacles? Let's gonna, we're going to name them. We're going to name them and work through them. And I want you to be praying throughout this. Past shame is an obstacle from you getting into what God has called you to. That plagues your mind. I'm talking to people who are free from sin, who are spirit-filled. You're not bound because you've responded to the gospel, praise God. But past shame is eating you up. Because I did this, I can't do that. Says who? Says who? I bind the words of the adversary, the lies of the devil that plague your mind. To say that because of X, Y, Z, I can't do this. When God's called you to this. If God's called you to this, it doesn't matter what's in your past. It doesn't matter what plagues your mind. Let's let's allow the Spirit to work through that and go where God's called us to go. Lord, help your people. Come on, it's not just about past shame, it's about current shame. There may be something we're in right now where we know we've tripped up, we've messed up, and we're saying, oh no, woe is me. I, I, I'm, I can't be used now. I'm tainted. I'm unclean. I'm preaching to somebody in here. Current shame's weighing you down. I can't do this. And some of you may be thinking, yeah, I mean, if somebody's, you know, somebody's doing something wrong, then... And they can't be in the game. If you think I'm somebody who's up at this pulpit preaching is perfect, right? You got another thing coming. Whoever said you have to be perfect to be used by God? There are numerous stories in the scripture of imperfect people who were used by God. Stop lying to yourself. Get out of the sin, confess it, work through it, and let's get back to work. I like what pastor says. He says, if you mess up, fess up, and fix it. I'm not going to move away from that. I feel like this, this current shame and past shame, this idea of shame is this cloud that hangs over us. It's, it's almost like wearing a mask when you're trying to worship. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. I hate those masks. 
I cannot wait for this thing to be over. But you know what I'm talking about? You're trying to sing and your face is getting all sweaty and you feel inhibited and you can't really do what you want to do because there's this blockage. I feel like the shame is, is that mask that's over us, that's inhibiting us from actually expressing what God has called us to express or to accomplish what he's called us to do. I, we have to get to a point where we can break through the cloud of shame. Stop wallowing in the mud of your, of your, of your shame. Stop wallowing in, in, in the sin. Get up, dust yourself off, and allow God to heal you, to work you, to cleanse you, to clothe you with his righteousness, and let's get to work. <laughs> Come on, can we praise through that cloud right now? Come on, somebody needs to praise God and express worship to Him. Hallelujah. Thank you for your response and obedience. I realized after I asked you to do that, I asked you to do that through a mask. But are you with me in the spirit? There's got to be something that breaks, a cloud that breaks over us so that we can be freed to do what God has called us to do. It's not how you start. It's that you're in it. You don't have to be perfect, but you got to do something. Come on, let's keep moving here. Other obstacles, offense, my goodness. Come on. If there's a, the, one of the biggest disruptors of the church accomplishing what God has called the church to do is disunity. Allowing offense to take root in your heart will always hold you back. If shame is a cloud, I'd say offense is an anchor. These are obstacles. These are, these are ways, of the reasons that we convince ourselves of disengagement. Just like the shame, get over it. Give forgiveness. Allow God to work in your heart. Talk to your brother. Confess it. Don't leave it hidden. Get it uncovered so that we can be healed, whole, and in unity for the work God's called us to do. Oh, my goodness. How about this one? Misplaced approval. Oh, Lord, help us. Some excuses we make for being disengaged is we're waiting for somebody to tap us on the shoulder to, to see our greatness and elevate us to a place where we could finally do what God's called us to do. Did you hear the sarcasm in my voice? It's misplaced approval. You're waiting for somebody else when that's not who you should be looking to. God has called you, has formed you, has gifted you, has made you. He has a plan for your life. Look to him. Listen for his voice. Feel for his touch and his pull to call you where God has called you to be. I'm taking my time through these. These are obstacles. We have to address and overcome in order to be where God's called us to be. It's not how you start. doesn't matter the conditions of where you're at right now. It matters that you're in it. And the Lord wants us to address these excuses, these obstacles that stand in the way of us just putting our foot in and getting in the game. What about our age? I'm, I'm too young. Or I'm too old. All of these hyphen young adults are doing the work. Maybe, maybe it's time for them. And I'm just going to step out and retire. Or maybe it's a young person that feels like, man, I feel like I got something to contribute. I got something to do. Why, why am I not the one up there leading the charge? Are you hearing me? These are excuses that inhibit us from doing what God's called us to do. Here's the last one here, inexperience. I don't know. I'm not comfortable. 
God's called you to contribute to the work. It may look different for me than it does for you, but whatever God's called you to, that's for you. And you can't say, oh, I'm inexperienced or, or, uh, you know, or what that Moses spirit, right? I stutter or I don't, I'm uncomfortable. I don't, I don't really know what to do. Well, you know how to fix that? Get some training. Take a class, join a group, ask somebody, get a mentor, seek it out. Don't let an experience be an excuse from stopping you to do what God's called you to do. It doesn't matter how you start. It's not how you start. It's that you're in it. It's that you're in it. This may have been something somebody used recently, but, but it just comes to mind right now. This idea about moving a vehicle. It's easier to move it or, or to steer it when it's actually moving. Steering a parked car. That's what, it, that's what it seems like we're doing. But let me tell you, excuses may come easy. But I've come to tell you this morning, regardless of how you feel, do the work. Even if you've messed up, do the work. Somebody say, do the work. Even if someone has offended you. Even if you can disqualify yourself. Do the work. Do the work. Can we be honest and say that in our flesh, I'm not even spiritualizing this. I'm just talking about in our flesh, in our energy. There's times where we just don't want to do the work. We allow ourselves to be distracted. And it never helps my poor son, I'm going to call him out. I wasn't planning on this. I love my Hayden Reese. He's my 10-year-old boy. Can we give it up for Hayden? He's a, he's, he's a brilliant young man, has an engineering mind. You give him some blocks or Legos, he could build it up real good. Heather and I homeschool our kids, like many of you are doing now. <laughs> we did it before it was cool. And Heather uh, does a wonderful job teaching all four of our kids. And Hayden and I were working together over the summer. Well, Heather may have something to say about that. I was trying to help Hayden over the summer with his history work. He had some catching up to do. And we'd find some days where he would just, we'd have his assignments, have his checklist. All right, buddy, go ahead. Do the work. This is what you got to do. You understand that? What you got to do? Okay, yeah. Come to the end of the day, and he did the first thing and tried to act like he did the rest. Oh, boy. Called you out. Of course, we reprimand him and help, help him understand you're just delaying the process. Are you hearing me? You're going to have to do the work. You could, you could have your list of things to do and act like you're doing it. But sooner or later, there's going to be a point of accountability and you're going to have to do it anyway. So whether it's now or later, son, do the work. I know you, you would rather be playing Legos. I, I know you would rather be paying attention to what your siblings are talking about. But do the work. Get it done. Church, I, I, I want to challenge you here. Can we stop playing church? Can, can we stop being religious and feeling good about ourselves, but about coming into a bu- oh Lord help us coming into a building every week or tuning into to a channel every week and, and and satisfying ourselves, thinking that we're doing a good job or trying to convince ourselves and others that we're doing a good job? Do the work. What did Jesus call His church for? It's to be witnesses of him to all the world. It's to declare the gospel to every creature. Do the work. Do the work. It's not how you start. It's that you're in it. It's that you're chugging along. It's that you're doing it in whatever way that you can. Whatever way God has provisioned for you to do it. Do the work. 
It's not about what's publicly viewed. Do the private work. It's not how you start. It's that you're in it. Come on, let's, let's keep going here. There's, there's a very important message that's going to help us here. I believe this is the part that's going to give us relief. Participation is your job. Perfection comes from time with Jesus. I said that slowly, but I'll repeat it. Perfe- participation, doing the work, that's your job. Just participate. Don't worry about perfection or, or, or being the best or whatever. Just participate. Perfection comes with time with Jesus. And I, I pray that this relieves you because I'm talking to two sets of people here. I'm talking to the perfectionists and the sensationalists. Don't wait for perfection to do something that God's called you to do. No, it's not the right time or, or the feelings of inadequacy. You disqualify yourself. Oh, man. You disqualify yourself because you know you, and you can't do that. You can't, you can't be used that way. And, and you convince yourself of this, that you have to be perfect, or the circumstances have to be perfect in order for you to step in to what God has called for you. But on the other way that I relate to this sensationalist, they get bored. We get bored. I don't know if there's anybody that can relate. The sensationalist can dis- get, get discontent that things aren't happening quick enough. That, that you, you step in and do the work, but then you get distracted to move to something else because it's not as fun, you know, there's something that's more fun to do or something that you feel like will be more rewarding. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about things being perfect or or needing to be the right fit or feeling right. Just participate. Participation is your job. Perfection comes from time with Jesus. Just take the next step and let Jesus work on you. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12, it says it this way. This is Paul talking. I don't mean to say that I have every, already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Are you getting the picture? Participation is your job. Perfection comes from time with Jesus. Let's keep reading. No, dear brothers and sisters, I, I have not achieved it, but, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Uh, can, I, can I insert some things here? Releasing the shame. Breaking through that cloud of shame. Forgetting the past. And looking forward to this one thing. For what lies ahead. Verse 14 says this. I press on to reach the end of the race. And to achieve the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. It's your job to participate. Perfection comes with times with Jesus. James says it this way. James chapter 1, verse 4. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Let me say it this way. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. Let me put it this way. Just get in the game and let Jesus work on you. Let me put it this way. It's not about how you start. It's that you're in it. It's that you're doing it. It's that you're starting. It's time to get started. John chapter 4, verse 35 says it this way. Say ye not that there are yet four months and then the harvest comes. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look onto the fields, for they are white, ready for harvest. Keep reading. 
And he that reapeth with wages and gathereth fruit and unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is a true saying, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into, into their labors. What Jesus was telling his disciples is don't feel like you have a lot of time. Don't, don't think you got four months before the harvest. No, look, right now, the harvest is white. It's ready. The time is now, is what he's saying. And, and he said, he even described it. He's like the fruits that he's talking about are, are, are bringing people into this eternal life. And that whether you were the one who sowed or you were the one who reaped, we all get to rejoice because of the harvest. I know I'm talking to many different people, different ages, of different backgrounds, of different experiences, different even relationship, levels of relationship with God. But all I know is what my Savior just told me is it doesn't matter what role that I play, as long as I'm in it, I can rejoice with his church. Oh, is this helping somebody in here? Don't feel like being at the pulpit is the only way that you get to preach the gospel. No, 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 no. Don't feel like the, the only way that you could serve is by standing up here on the platform and singing in the praise team or the choir or, or being an usher or Sunday school teacher. Yes, do these things. But listen to the voice of God, your creator, who's made you and gifted you to be a part of his kingdom for such a time as this. I'm not going to put any limits on what God wants to do through you. And I pray that you don't either. In fact, I pray that, that the barriers and obstacles that we talked about would start falling down. That the Spirit of God that's in this room would start working its way through those places of your heart and your mind and breaking down those excuses. And then we could see whatever it is that God has for us. But whether you see it or not, take the next step. Don't stay still until you get a clear picture and then you take your step. No, no, no. He's calling you by faith. You may not know the plans God has for you, but he knows the plans he has for you. So it's the Lord that's calling you right now where you're sitting, wherever you may be, and he's telling you to take that next step. It's not how you start. It's that you're in it. Stand with me, please. Now is not the time to stay still. Idleness is not an option. I don't know what's going through your head, but if you're anything like me, I want to try to figure this all out. Okay, well, what, is, what does this mean? Is what does this look like for me? And I, I want to try to paint the picture. Let me put it to you this way. First of all, what we need to do right now is allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. If you come in here unrepentant, you need to repent and let your purpose be changed. Did you hear me? If you have unrepentantness in your heart, if you have something that's covered, uncover it and let God work on you and remove that excuse. But let's say you feel like you've repented and, and you feel like you're, you're good to go. Well, let me tell you, your next step is to make sure you don't leave here without being a part of the ministry that God's called you to. It, 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 let, let God speak through you to encourage a brother or sister. Take Sign up for a class. Join a group. Take a Bible study. Give a Bible study. In fact, 
I think it would be wonderful if Sister Candace joined Brother Donnie and I in that tent in the white back, back there. And anybody who wanted a Bible study or to give a Bible study or to host a Bible study, stop by. I think it'd be great if, if somebody went up to Sister Shalon and said, hey, when's the next time we're having groups? Or, or how can I host or, or be a part of these teach and talk groups? Is this helping paint the picture? What I would hate to see, and you've experienced this yourself, don't tell me you haven't, is that you'd look back over a certain amount of time with regret. I wish I would have done this. And the barrier between you accomplishing the thing that you regret is you actually taking the step to do the work of breaking off the lies and the excuses and making it a priority. Am I helping somebody in here? I I feel like this may just even be a rah-rah speech for the church. We got to act like the church. We got to act like the church. We got to do the work. We have to help people experience God. We have to help people grow in their faith, serve others, and go reach this world. You can't tell me you don't know what to do. God has sent you here to abundant life so you can participate in the ministry that God's called you to. Let's pray all across this place. Father, we turn to you. I trust, Lord, that your spirit is at work in this place that the message you've laid on my heart is for us for such a time as this. Lord, let us be moved with compassion when we see the news. Lord, let us not have hatred in our hearts or disdain or judge, be even being judgmental. Lord, but let us, as you did, have compassion on the multitudes and, and, and respond to your call for the laborers. Father, I, I want to be the laborer. I want to be a part of the reward. Good workers get good rewards, and I want to be a good worker. Father, I pray, Lord, not for my sake only, but for all those that are here, that we together would respond to this call, that we would lay off, put off every weight, every measure, that we would would, uh, forget and, and lay down the past, that we would break up the shame, allow you into the deepest places of our heart so we can break through and be who you called us to be. I pray, Lord, that you would give your church gifts and roles, Lord, so that we could carry out the work. Lord, for some, a spirit of intercession. For some, gifts of healing, Lord. For for some, words of wisdom or encouragement or discernment, Lord. Let it fall among your people. I pray that there would be a a desire in us, a, a a, a, a defiance almost to break away from plain church or trying to look the part but actually doing what we can to do the work and Father you've already promised us that in this last days we would experience revival Lord let revival be in faith eyes for your people under the sound of my voice Lord, let us respond in faith, Lord, for what you're going to do, not through somebody else, but through us. Lord, what you're going to do because of the words of my mouth and the works of my hands that bring you glory. (laughs) Oh, I thank you, Jesus, for that image, Lord, of of your spirit being poured out on on all flesh. Lord, of, of lives being changed and transformed because of the power of your gospel. Lord, let your gospel come from my lips and be a part of your Savior.